Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the online gatherings of worship of the chapel. We're so grateful to God that you're here with us. Thank you for being with us. And before I get started, just a couple of things that uh, you should know. First of all, is that um, we're not going rogue by doing what we're doing today. Uh, This is something that we are allowed to do. We've been in contact with uh, the state uh, as well as at the federal level and certainly the state, you know, we wanted to make sure that we were honoring what they asked of us. Um, but we are, they have not required that we as a house of worship be closed and that we have identified essential personnel to be able to do uh, what we're doing with you today. So we're doing it legally um, and we still have to maintain, uh, you know, and honor kind of the, the boundaries and the distancing and that kind of stuff. I don't know if you know, I have a really long wingspan and whether you can tell or not uh, in the way that we're set up with camera angles, we've honored the distancing uh, and all of those things. We checked our temperatures before we showed up just to make make sure that nobody was going to be compromised along that line as well. So uh, just wanted you to, to know that so that you had full confidence that we were honoring um, what uh, the, the governing authorities have asked of us, and we're doing that. Now, that said, I want to remind you that normally we are one church that is gathering at four different locations, our Cross Point campus in Getzville, and then we have a Cheektowaga campus, a Lockport campus, and a Niagara Falls campus. And so here with me, we've got uh, a handful of our worship leaders from multi-campuses that are with us, as well as having our campus pastors that are here as well. We've got Leroy Wiggins, who's our campus pastor at our Cheektowaga campus, Jonathan Drake, who's leading our uh, Niagara Falls campus, and John Grimaldi over here, who is leading our Lockport campus. And so we're excited to be able to worship with you today. And uh, without any further ado, I'm going to hand it off to John Cook, who's going to be kind of emceeing and hosting for us today. And I'm looking forward to sharing the word with you here in just a few minutes. Thanks. Hey, good morning, everyone. We are glad to be here with you today. And I'm actually watching what's happening online. And so many of you are already jumping in. We have a ton of people. I just want to say hello to a few. Uh, But thankful for this platform. Thankful that we do get to do this online, even though we can't gather together in person. If you're watching on Facebook Live, I would really encourage you to interact with us. There's a chat function right there. And you can let us know who you are, where you're watching from, maybe who you're watching with. We already had someone say that they were watching uh, in the comfort of their own living room with their cats. So hello to you. Glad that you're doing that. I'm sure there's people watching with family and friends. And uh, whether you're alone or whether you're with close friends or family uh, in your own home, we are really, really glad to be connecting with you. If you're not watching on Facebook Live, if you're watching at thechapel.com or if you're watching on the Roku channel, I would still encourage you to interact with us. You can go to uh, your Instagram account, go to your Twitter account, at Chapel Buffalo is a way for you to uh, send us messages. And I'm gonna be watching that throughout the day just to hear from all of you, kind of where you're at and how you're learning, how you're tracking with us along those lines. And so I wanna call out a few uh, by name. Wanna say hi to Debbie in Attica, Linda in Sloan, Janice watching in Hamilton, Ontario, Janet from Cheektowaga, Michelle, Daryl, Tim, Derek. We got people watching from Florida, people watching from Kaisertown, from Fort Collins, just a ton of people that are joining in. I'm watching the number go up and up. That's not because we're excited just for the number. We just realized the reach that we have the opportunity to connect with you. Maybe you're watching today because a friend shared this on their Facebook feed and so really want to say hello to you. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning. Uh, Throughout the program today, you're going to have an opportunity to let us know not just where you're at and where you're uh, from, but also what you're learning. We'd love to hear comments of what God's doing in your life and how you're seeing him be faithful. We're going to sing some songs along those lines in a minute and hear a message of truth later on in our time. It is definitely a different day for us today as Pastor Jerry already mentioned, but uh, I'm really glad it's Sunday. I'm really glad that we have the chance to connect together, to worship, and to learn. And so I wanna start us off, uh, Nick's gonna lead us in a song, and I wanna start by just reading the lyric of this song and really encourage you to lean into this time, to really, you're, you've spent time right now, you've kinda set time aside to, uh, to worship and to learn and to connect, and so I wanna just help you in that by giving you a chance to hear clearly the lyric that we're gonna sing together. It says this, let, br- let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise, let praise arise. We want that today, don't we? Let's sing together. Yeah. 
praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all anxiety. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We sing your name in the dark and it changes everything. We sing with all we are and we claim your victory. Let it rise. Let praise arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on our side. Forever lift him high with all creation cry. Let faith be the song that calms the storm inside of me. Let it rise. Let faith arise. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. We cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthroughs on lift him high with all creation cry God we praise you Whoa, we praise you Whoa, we praise you Whoa, we praise you Whoa, This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like This is what heaven sounds like We praise you, we praise you This is what living looks like This is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. We cannot survive. We believe that it's appropriate for us not just to declare our trust through song, but to lean into that trust through prayer and declaring our dependence on the one, the God who is on our side. Um, and so we get to celebrate that through song, but we also get to declare it in prayer. And so we want to uh, read a few different passages of scripture um, to align our hearts with what God wants for us today. And then out of each of those passages of scripture, I would invite you wherever you're watching or listening to join us in prayer. And so first Psalm 73 verse 28 says this, but as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of all your deeds. Let's pray together. Father, we know that the goodness that you've shown us in Jesus is what allows us to be near to you. As for me, it is good 
to be near the Lord. But God, we understand that because of our sin, that separated us, that created distance between us. Yet in Christ, in Jesus, who died for our sin and because of our sin and rose from the dead conquering sin, we get to be brought near. And therefore, you are our refuge. You are our shelter. You are our safe place. And Lord, because we know that you protect us, no matter the storm, no matter the giant, no matter the wall in front of us, we know that we'll be able to tell of all your good deeds, tell all about what you've done in and through us. Lord, we praise you. We thank you in Christ's name. But the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I've said to you. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for these words in John 14. And we thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit the same spirit that was alive in your son Jesus, that empowered him to minister in the face of adversity, love and respond to hatred, sacrifice in the midst of oppression, is the same spirit that you've given to us. May your spirit be awakened in us and inflamed by our worship and learning here this morning. Would you give us vision to see the opportunities that are before each one of us? Would you guide us in the many decisions we have to make during these very uncertain times? Would you help us to be the people of the repeated opportunity, giving those around us the ability to hear and see the gospel on display through our words and actions. Father, we thank you for the peace that you give, a true peace that is grounded not in circumstances, in finances, or in systems, but in the person of Jesus Christ. Through Christ, we see that you are above all things, that you are the author of life, and that you are working out all things for good. Because of Christ, we have hope, hope for our future and hope for our present. Father, in moments when we become weighed down by anxiety and worry, we ask that you restore our peace by lifting our eyes to look once again back to our Savior who faced the greatest hardships ever endured by man and did not miss a step in fulfilling his purpose for the kingdom. May we walk each day empowered by your spirit, steadied by your peace, remembering the truth of who you are and who you've created us to be. Philippians 4, 6, 7. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgivings, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Father, it's because of our relationship with Jesus Christ and what you've promised us in your word that we come before you today with grateful and thankful hearts this morning. Lord, we find security and peace in knowing that you, a God who doesn't lie, a God who can't lie, that you have promised that you will never leave us. And knowing that there is nothing that can separate us from you brings us great comfort, great joy, and great peace. And while everything going around us might give us reason for being anxious, God, everything that you say in your word says just the opposite. That we lean on the Lord, that he is our rock, that he is our light, that he is our salvation, that he is our protection. So Father, as we lean on your understanding and not our own, we ask that you would guard our hearts and our minds from the things that would want to distract us from you, that you will help us to remain steadfast and focused on the hope that we have in you, the hope that we have in Christ. And Lord, may you be magnified in everything. In the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our risen Lord and Savior, amen. Your mercy never fails me. 
of your voice You have led me through the fire In darkest nights You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend And I have lived in the goodness not changed. He's good. In fact, as we were asking some of you online how you've seen the goodness of God show up in your life, I'm just, I'm amazed because I know this to be true of the God that we know. Rita said this, I've seen the goodness of God throughout this whole week and I accepted him as my savior on Monday. I pray that he helps me break these chains of addiction I have in Jesus' name. And Denise said, Jesus recently broke my chains of addiction. He is able to and he is willing. And you're just lighting up comments with other ways and places you've seen God at work and remain good and remain faithful. And I wanna encourage you that that is the truth, that that is the truth. And we're about to hear a message where we understand the truth of God's word. And so what I wanna do is encourage you to grab a Bible if you have one, if you don't, that's okay. Maybe you can pull it up on your phone or just watch. We're gonna have the scripture verses we're referencing right on your screen. You also may wanna pull out a pen and a blank piece of paper or a notebook if you're used to taking notes because we're gonna get into some things that you're gonna to wanna to jot down and remember and apply to your life. And also if you're in a community group and you're looking for those uh, discussion questions that you usually get, you can go to thechapel.com slash notes and all those questions are right there. You can use those later on in the week as you have discussions and process through what we're learning. But let me pray for us, and then Pastor Jerry's gonna bring us our message for the day. Father, thank you for the opportunity to be able to worship you as we have, to acknowledge you and your goodness. Father, we are so grateful for the truth that you are unchanging, that you are faithful, and that you are good. And today, Father, I pray that as we dive into our message for the day, that you would soften our hearts, that you would open our ears, and that you would give Pastor Jerry the words to speak that would bring encouragement, that would bring truth, and that would bring uh, security and a foundation that we know that we have in you. For those that are watching today who are feeling uh, helpless or hopeless, God, I pray that you would allow them to listen in to the truth of who you are. For it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. 
Well, amen. Thank you so much, uh, everybody, for leading us in worship and for this time together. It's, uh, uh, I'm so grateful for it. Uh, some of you may have been in a place in your life where you have been uh, in the military. Maybe you have a military family member. Maybe you, maybe you yourself uh, have been in the military. Um, I, I would encourage you to, to think about maybe the very first things that you learned, if you were enlisted, maybe the very first things that you learned. Some of us know about the things that you learned. You learn immediately some marches when you are there uh, in basic training or whatever it is you may be doing there. Um, you, you're going to learn some of these things. And there's some basic commands around some of these marches that maybe you remember. Um, and some of us maybe have an idea of those as well. For instance, mark time march. Well, that had to do with actually marching in place, right? I mean, that was what that was. You're marking time, kind of a cadence, but you're marching in place. Or maybe you remember this command, halt. You don't need any interpretation for that. That simply means stop marching, right? And there's a way that you go about doing that after a step and then, you know, then you stop. Or maybe the most famous, I think, at least for those civilians, the most famous command would be forward march. All of us know what that means, right? Uh, forward march. It means that we were in one place and we are now heading and continuing on uh, the path or the mission or whatever it is that we're supposed to be doing. Now, why would uh, drill instructors and sergeants and why would they be giving these kinds of instructions for um, soldiers that are just enlisted? Well, there's a reason. It's not just to learn how to march well. Um, it has to do with discipline. It has to do with order. It has to do with hearing a command and knowing how to obey it. Because here's what happens. What these kind of weathered um, leaders and officers and sergeants and drill instructors know is they're not preparing soldiers just to learn how to march. They're preparing soldiers for the heat of battle. And you and I both know that when the battle comes and when the battle ensues, that there's a lot of chaos. Some have called it the fog of war. And that when this goes on, we have to be able to recognize commands and be able to act on them and know what we're supposed to do when the battle rages. Now, we've been studying over the last number of weeks in Ephesians 6, and we've been talking about this idea of the art of war. It's a, uh, a series where we've been looking at kind of the resources, or as Paul calls it, the armor that God has given to us to be able to face the spiritual battle that we find ourselves in because we need to understand that when we find ourselves in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the fog of a spiritual battle, that we need to understand the resources we have and the commands that we've been given. So I want you, if you can, with me to turn your attention to Ephesians chapter 6, and we're going to begin in verse number 13. Here's what the passage says. Paul writes, therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground and after you have done everything to stand. Then he goes on to say, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to, the, to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Now, in all of these, we have been studying them over recent history, and we've been looking at every piece kind of of the armor in terms of what we understand Paul has instructed us to be able to outfit ourselves with. And here, we have two new elements of the armor that are introduced to us from our study, and that is a helmet and a sword. Now, when Paul talks about this helmet of salvation, he's actually pulling from um, the, the Old Testament here. This is actually a term that's used in Isaiah when Isaiah is prophesying about this uh, mighty warrior who is going to uh, rescue the people of Zion. He's actually giving us a picture of who Jesus would ultimately be, and he uses this terminology there. It's in Isaiah chapter 59, verses 16 and 17, and it says this. 
it's God speaking. Or he saw that there was no one. He was appalled that there was no one to intervene. So his own arm achieved salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him. He put on righteousness as his breastplate and the helmet of salvation on his head. Now, this is why I want us to pay attention to this because when we see this idea of a helmet of salvation, we know that Paul is using this term from the Old Testament itself. And when Paul uses this term from the Old Testament, he's giving us a picture of Jesus. Now, think of it this way. This word salvation in the uh, Hebrew text is actually this word, Yeshu Ah. Now, if you think about it, maybe that sounds a little bit familiar to you. Yeshu Ah. Now, this is the foundation actually for Jesus' actual name, Yeshua, which means salvation or Jehovah saves or Yeshua saves. Now, when we begin to understand that, we know that this is actually pointing us to Jesus, that this idea of a helmet of salvation is actually pointing us to Jesus. Now, that term can actually be used in a different way as well. That term can be used to describe the idea of victory. So when, when we see God having on a helmet of salvation or Jesus prophesied to have this helmet of salvation on his head... We know that Jesus doesn't need saving, that he's the one doing the saving. It is we who need to experience salvation in him. But we also know that this term means victory so that we could see that, this, that Jesus is wearing this helmet of victory that he is securing for us through his death for our sins and for his resurrection from the dead, conquering death and sin and the grave on our behalf. This is a helmet of victory. Now, Paul actually uses this term in another place, not just that he's borrowing it from the Old Testament and using it in Ephesians chapter six. Paul actually uses this term when he's writing to the church at Thessalonica as well. Listen to what he says in 1 Thessalonians chapter five, beginning in verse number eight. It says, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober, putting on faith and love as a breastplate, still using that armor language right there, and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Here, Paul is instructing the church at Thessalonica to put on this helmet of salvation because it is the hope that we have. Now, you and I may start to understand this a little bit differently when we start thinking about what this means for us. There's a reason that we wear helmets. Now, I'm not talking about just the helmet that we wear in football, you know, it kind of protects our head. But generally speaking, the idea of a helmet for a soldier, when Paul's talking about Roman soldiers, it's to protect the head because of what's in the head. It's not just protecting this beautiful dome and this beautiful face that you all have. I'm not talking about myself, but that you have, of course. But it's talking about what is inside our heads. You see, this is about our minds. This is about the thing that is actually kind of the governing factor of our very lives, right? This is kind of command central inside of our head, the idea of the way that we think and our minds. So when Paul is using this phrase that we need to wear a helmet of salvation, he's actually talking about this, that we need to be able to saturate our minds with the reality of the totality of Jesus' salvation, what God has done for the world in Jesus, that though everyone has sinned and come short of the glory of God, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever would believe in him would not perish but would have everlasting or eternal life. This idea is imperative for us because when we recognize that by faith in what Jesus has done in dying in our place for sin to satisfy the justice of God and rising from the dead, when we begin to let that pour over our minds, it changes the way that we think about everything. And by the way, this isn't just some kind of um, spiritual idea that floats out in the ether that just lives in the nether regions that you kind of go, I don't know what to do with that. That's just a good idea for me spiritually. Well, it is a good idea for you spiritually, but what we understand spiritually is so that we can act in the world that we live in. Because we are in a world right now where these things are real to us. We feel like we are in a battle. So this is not just something that's spiritual and invisible, though it is. 
It's also something that matters in the context of the real world, that our minds are saturated with the reality of the truth of the gospel, and it changes the way we think about everything. I'll give you an example. Um, after World War II, a number of people wrote a number of different things about how the world had changed. Uh, one of those, as you could imagine, was C.S. Lewis, who lived through that time of World War II. And in, in 1948, he wrote this um, little piece called On Living in an Atomic Age. You see, the concern was is that what we saw at the end of World War II was we saw bombs that were going off that were weightier and more devastating than anything that anybody had ever dreamed. These were the things for many of them of nightmares, right? This was sci-fi kind of stuff for people. And now the whole world was living under the reality that multiple nations were trying to make these huge bombs that could detonate and destroy cities at a time. And so Lewis writes in 1948 about what that is actually like. And I want you to understand what he's saying because he's actually talking about our minds. Here's what he said. He said, in one way, we think a great deal too much of the atomic bomb. How are we to live in an atomic age? I'm tempted to reply, why, as you would have lived in the 16th century when the plague visited London almost every year or as you would have lived in a Viking age when raiders from Scandinavia might land and cut your throat any night, or indeed as you are already living in an age of cancer, an age of syphilis, an age of paralysis, an age of air raids, an age of railway accidents, an age of motor accidents. In other words, do not let us begin by exaggerating the novelty of our situation. Believe me, dear sir or madam, you and all whom you love were already sentenced to death before the atomic bomb was ever even built. I think we lost it, was ever even invented. And quite a high percentage of us were going to die in unpleasant ways. We had indeed one very great advantage over our ancestors, anesthetics, but we have that still. It is perfectly ridiculous to go about whimpering and drawing long faces because the scientists have added one more chance of painful and premature death to a world which already bristled with such chances and in which death itself was not a chance at all but a certainty. This is the first point to be made. And the first action to be taken is to pull ourselves together. If we are all going to be destroyed by an atomic bomb, let that bomb, when it comes, find us doing sensible and human things. Praying, working, teaching, reading, listening to music, bathing the children, playing tennis, chatting to our friends over a pint, don't get too carried away, and a game of darts, not huddled together like frightened sheep and thinking about bombs. They may break our bodies, a microbe can do that, but they need not dominate our minds. You see, this is imperative for us to be able to think about because when what Lewis is trying to say to us is this. Lewis is trying to help us understand that our minds don't need to be given over to realities that we already know, in fact, exist that to every single one of us, right, death has been promised. We already know that. And I'm not trying to be morbid here. We already know that. The Kind of the statistical chances. Look at the models. One out of every one, right? That's just the world that we live in. But what we need to understand is if we live in fear of every single opportunity that may come our way, that we're never going to be able to fulfill what it is that God desires of us. And what he desires of us is to have minds that are shaped by the reality of the gospel, the hope that we have in the resurrected Christ, the hope that we have in this life and in the life to come. And that when our minds are saturated with the reality of what God has done in Jesus Christ through his beautiful salvation for all who believe, it can change the way that we operate even in a time of pandemic. Because if you were wise enough, then you could have read Lewis's words like they were hitting us today and just changed out atomic bomb and put in the word pandemic. You see, we don't need our minds reshifted. That's what it means when we talk about the helmet of salvation. 
But he also offers to us, Paul does in Ephesians 6, he also offers to us uh, another one of these pieces of armor, not only this helmet, but he talks about a sword. He refers to it as the sword of the spirit or the word of God. I, I think you'll notice that in all of the particular pieces of armor that we have described here in Ephesians 6, beginning in verse 13, all the way down that we've already read, what we find is this, is that this sword is the only weapon of attack. You see, we have defensive armor that's on, that's strapped to us, right? We've got this belt of truth that kind of hold, thing, hold things together and gives us a preparation. And we've got a breastplate of righteousness and we've got feet that are shod with the gospel of peace. We have a shield of faith to be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. And we have a helmet of salvation. But now we have this sword of the spirit that operates both defensively in warding things off but also is used as an offensive weapon. It's a weapon of attack. I don't have to take you any farther than when we look at Jesus when he was just coming out of the waters of baptism, beginning his ministry, and the Spirit takes him into the wilderness. And as the Spirit takes him into the wilderness, he goes there to be tempted by the evil one. And in that temptation... Every single one that we're allowed to be able to see, and I'm imagining since Jesus was there for 40 days and 40 nights, I'm imagining that, um, that there were multiple temptations that went on with the enemy, but the three that we have recorded in the scripture, do you know how Jesus responded to every single one of them? With the sword of the spirit. Every single time. I mean, Leroy, think about that. If Jesus needed... And Jesus chose, with all the weapons that are available to him, if Jesus chose to use the sword of the spirit, then what in the world are we doing, right? When we get faced with these things, what in the world are we doing? We need to use the word of God offensively as well because Jesus did. This shouldn't surprise us. This was prophesied about Jesus, that the word of God would be this sword that would come out of his mouth. Listen to what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 11 when he was prophesying about the Messiah. It says, but with righteousness, he will judge the needy and with justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. This was actually prophesied about the son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, notice what it says in Revelation chapter 19, because we see the consummation of this at the end of all things. Coming out of his mouth, this is describing Jesus. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. You see, the sword was an offensive weapon for Jesus, and it should be an offensive weapon for us. You see, this idea, this sword of the spirit, it's fundamental to the elements of the armor that we all have on. Think about it for just a moment. When we see the belt of truth, we can't understand truth without understanding Jesus and how Jesus is revealed in the word, right? The scripture itself says, Jesus says when he prays for his disciples and prays for us, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So we see the belt of truth is contingent upon this sword that we have. Uh, righteousness and peace that we have described in these elements? How do we know about the righteousness of Christ? How do we know about the peace that only he brings? We know it because of the revelation of the truth of the word of God. How about the shield of faith? Well, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ, the scripture says. So every single one of these pieces has an attachment to this sword that we use. And it is not just defensive, but it's actually offensive. Now, I find it interesting that the, one of the most famous, maybe the most famous book in all of Christian history outside of the Bible itself is a book that was written over from 1677 to 1678 by a man named John Bunyan. You may have heard of it. It's called The Pilgrim's Progress. And in kind of Christian literature, it's probably the most famous um, that exists outside of the Bible itself. Now, the main character is Christian, and this whole story is an allegory about the Christian life. Now, he uses the word Christian to describe his, uh, his main character, 
And Christian in this setting, in the fourth movement or the fourth section of the Pilgrim's Progress, is about to come face to face with Apollyon. It was a picture of the enemy, right, of the devil. And I want you to notice what is said in that passage from 1678. And the the language is a little bit, uh, you know, kind of early English, so stay with me here. He says, but now in this valley of humiliation, poor Christian was hard put to it. For he had gone but a little way before he noticed a foul fiend coming over the field to meet with him. His name was Apollyon. Then Christian began to be afraid and to toss in his mind whether to go back or to stand his ground. But he considered again that he had no armor for his back and therefore thought that to turn his back to him might give him a greater advantage so that he could pierce him with ease with his darts. Therefore, he resolved to be bold and stand his ground. Now, when I think about that, I'm reminded of something incredibly important. First of all, that what Bunyan told us was this, is that there's no armor that's described here by Paul. There's no armor for our back, that we weren't intended to run. We were intended to be able, in the resources and the power of God, to be able to stand. This was what we had in mind, and this is what I believe Paul has in mind, but there's something in addition to it. If I were to go on reading in that passage, and I'm not going to, but if I were, it described how Christian ended up fighting with Apollyon. And Apollyon landed a lot of blows and, and, and caused a bit of destruction, but Christian realized that he had an offensive weapon, the sword of the spirit. And he began to use that offensive weapon. And in fact, what he was doing is he was quoting scripture to the enemy. And do you know what happened? Eventually the enemy had to flee and Christian was able to stand and he was able to advance as he made his way to the holy city of Zion. You see, this is a picture for us. This is an allegory for us that comes right out of what we're talking about, that we have this helmet of salvation that changes the way that we look at the world because our minds are different and we have this sword of the spirit that helps us as an offensive weapon that we conform the truth of what we believe in our minds to the reality of our lives and it enables us to be able to move forward. Maybe we could say it this way. If you're taking notes, you could write this down. A mind guided and shielded by the gospel, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the the helmet of salvation. A mind that's guided and shielded by the gospel And a life that's ordered by the word, that's what we're talking about when we talk about the sword of the spirit. When those two things are in place, it allows us to move forward in the chaos of battle. Or maybe we could say, it allows us to be able to keep going in the fog of war. A mind that's guided and shielded by the gospel and a life ordered by the word allows us to move forward in the chaos of battle. You see, Ladies and gentlemen, this armor is necessary for every single aspect of our lives. What we face daily, it is necessary for that. And even more so in the day and age that we live in. We are living in a time right now where we are facing a pandemic. The whole world is up against this. And of course, in the United States, we are feeling this significantly. And it's one thing to be up against a kind of a physical, even though it's invisible to us, but it's a physical reality that's happening in our country and certainly in the world. It's one thing to be up against that, but when you add to that how the enemy is using this and wants to shoot flaming arrows at us of fear and doubt and despair in the midst of all of this, it can be all we can do just to be able to stand. Now, I wanna remind you, That in some cases in our lives, we have to just be able to stand. We're not not maybe being able to go forward at some points in our lives. We just need to be able to stand. But here's what I would remind you. Don't turn around and run. We don't have any armor for our backs. We are meant and we are built for in the resources of God to be able to stand. But I think that we can do more than stand. Even though I get it, sometimes maybe for some of us, that's where we are. I completely understand that. But for others of us, we have to realize that we can advance. 
we can still move forward in this battle. Just like our brothers and sisters in Christ in the early church did and through church history have done. Because make no mistake about it, we're not the first ones to endure hardship. We're not the first ones to endure tribulation. We're not the first ones to even endure a pandemic. I mean, I, in my research for this message as I was studying, I came across an article that was in a kind of an online magazine. It's called foreignpolicy.com. Uh, and there was a writer there, his name is Lyman Stone, and, and this article was from March 13th of this year. And he was actually chronicling some of the, um, some of the plagues that have happened in history. There was the Antonine Plague that happened in the second century. So the second century would have been the 100s, okay, AD. So this is just shortly after the birth of the church and kind of one generation removed. And the Antonine Plague was um, probably in the neighborhood or in the family of what we would call today smallpox, that that was what was afflicting really kind of the Roman Empire during that season. There was a mortality rate of about 25%. That's significant, one out of every four. And it ended up that millions uh, perished during that time frame. But do you know what happened to Christianity during that time? It spread. Do you know why? Because the, the New Testament, which by the way, the New Testament was actually new at that time. You know, there was a time in the world where the New Testament was new. You know, we look at it as, hey man, this is 2,000 years old. Well, this was new during that time. And do you know what those believers you know what they did? They acted like what was in it was true. They believed the words of Jesus. So when Jesus, as we have it recorded in Matthew 7, when he said, do to others what you would have them do to you, what we call the golden rule, they believed that. And they believed it in the midst of hardship. And do you know what they were doing? They were caring for the sick and the dying, sometimes at the expense of their own welfare. They were caring for them. And as a result, Christianity began to spread because they saw that they had a basis for doing this. If you fast forward another century into the third century, the 200s AD, they have what they call the plague of Cyprian. Uh, Cyprian was, was a bishop of Carthage, which was in North Africa. He was a Roman African uh, bishop uh, in the Christian church. They didn't name him that way. They didn't name the plague that way because it started with him. They named it that way because he spoke to this plague so significantly. It ravaged the Roman empire. And you know what believers did? They cared for the sick and the dying. That's what they did. They believed it when Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Do you know that they believed that, and they acted on that, and as a result, you know what happened? More people came to the faith and understanding who Jesus was. Fast forward another century. I know it, these early centuries, they faced a whole lot. In the fourth century, uh, the emperor of Rome was named Julian, and he actually was complaining that all of the Christians were taking care of the pagans like him and others. They were taking care of the pagans more than the pagans took care of the pagans. Do you know why Christians did that? Because they had a belief and a baseline of believing what God had said in Jesus Christ and what he had done. They, they were wearing this helmet of salvation. They knew what their future held regardless of what it held in this life. They knew and were confident in what God had done in Christ and that because of Jesus' resurrection that they too would be resurrected because of their belief in him. This was extraordinary. And Julian is complaining and he's saying these, these people care for pagans better than pagans care for pagans. Do you know why pagans didn't care for pagans? Because they didn't have a baseline of belief that gave them that. It was every person for themselves among the pagans. But for believers, they realized, consider one another above yourselves. Love your neighbor. They believed all of these things and they acted on it. In fact, Rodney Stark, when he wrote this really seminal book called The Rise of Christianity, and in missiological circles, it's one of the, it's one of the great uh, and classic books. He actually argued that in the cities where Christians were present and when they had a real robust presence in those cities, that the death rate in these plagues was half of what it was in other places. Because of believers acting like believers. 
If I wanted to fast forward you up to the 16th century, the 1500s, I could do that as well. Like the time of Martin Luther, for instance, where the bubonic plague is going around and killing so many people. Martin Luther was actually asked by a number of pastors who were facing this, this pandemic whether or not they, he felt they should be able to leave and flee from this plague. And in 1527, Martin Luther actually penned a written response. I read it this week just out of curiosity. And in some ways, I felt like I was reading something that was happening right this very moment. The way that Luther actually framed his argument wasn't by saying, what would Jesus do? Luther actually framed his argument by saying this, what if Jesus was those people that are sick, that are hurting? How would you then respond as a pastor? What if it were Jesus? Now that is significant. And what he's doing there is he's basing that out of the revelation of Matthew chapter 25, Jesus' own teaching. Whatever you've done for the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you have done also unto me. Now, Luther also talked about a number of different things. He talked, uh, I, I felt like I was reading, this was 1527. And he said, obey quarantine orders, fumigate your house, practice really good personal hygiene. And he didn't say that just to say to do it. He said it because he based that in, this is what it means to love our neighbor. We love our neighbor by honoring them in such a way that we aren't doing things that potentially could harm them, even though we know that there may be situations that some of us may be called into to have to be able to help them. You see, we need a clear-eyed view of the gospel, ladies and gentlemen. We have to understand that what, when we see the gospel so clearly, as we see in the revelation of the word of God, the sword of the spirit, and we have our minds transformed by that, we realize that the gospel teaches us that what Jesus did is Jesus bore our infirmities. Jesus bore our afflictions. That Jesus took on himself what we had so that we could walk free. This is the heartbeat actually of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we need to have minds that are guided and shielded by the reality of the gospel. And we need to have lives that are ordered by the revelation of the word of God. So how do we do that? Well, there's personally, we have to say, how does this work for us? Well, personally, if we're gonna have our minds guided and shielded by the gospel, and we're gonna have our lives ordered by the word, we realize that we, we're gonna to have to make some personal sacrifices. We're having to make personal sacrifices of convenience. Some of us, you know, we're, we're not doing that by choice, we're doing that by mandate right now. But what we need to do as believers is choose to be able to sacrifice some of our convenience. So we may need to stay home and we may need to honor what, these, what our officials are talking to us about. That we wash our hands, that we stay home, that maybe we order takeout to help some of the local businesses. Um, that maybe we, we sacrifice the convenience of our, of our speech. And in this time, instead of being divisive with our, sometimes where we let ourselves get pulled into political rhetoric, that maybe we could exchange that for prayer. That maybe we could take these freshly washed hands and fold them and be able to pray. Maybe what Jesus is looking for is us to be able to sacrifice some of our conveniences, maybe sacrifice some of our idols that have been built in our hearts, and maybe be able to leave those there and seek him with all of our hearts. And yes, maybe we are going to have to sacrifice for some others. There's no doubt that some of us will be called upon to do that. I mean, as Luther said, he said, political leaders can't leave their post and they can't do that now. He said, medical professionals, healthcare professionals, they can't leave their post and they can't do that now. First responders and law enforcement, they can't leave their post and they can't do that now. Pastors, they couldn't leave their post then and they can't leave their post now. And so many others of you, if I started naming, right? There's many of us, but listen, 
The sacrifices that we make are not for the purpose of putting that on social media so everyone praises us. The sacrifices that we make don't need to be for our own vain glory and pride. The sacrifices we make as believers are for the sake of the glory of God and for the good of other people. That we're motivated by the glory of God and the good of other people. So we may have to make some personal sacrifices, but on the corporate side, how do we put this into play? How do we get to a place where we have such a clear-eyed view of the gospel that our minds are guided by and shielded by the reality of the gospel and our, and our lives are conformed to the word of God. Well, I, I want you to know that as a church corporately, we've been in contact with both Erie and Niagara counties and we have said to them and shared with them that we stand ready to help them as needed. We, we told them we have facilities in both counties that if you had a need and we had to um, use our parking lots or whatever for, if we ever had to be able to do drive-through facilities uh, for testing and those kinds of things, they're not necessarily planning that right now. But if they were, we wanted to let them know, we're here for you. We're available for that. You let us know. We also told them, let us know what you need and we will see what we can do to be able to serve our community in any way that we can. We've also, as a church, been helping other local churches. Um, in fact, we've um, helped to coach them and allowed them to be able to do some of these same things that we're doing right now because maybe they didn't have an option to be able to do that. We pulled together a whole bunch of pastors and leaders in Western New York on a Zoom prayer call just a couple of days ago where we had them all on there by video conference interceding for our region and being able to pray for you and pray for one another. But there's something else that I wanna to mention to you that you can take action on. We're calling it the Armor Project. Let me explain what I'm talking about when we talk about the Armor Project. The Armor Project is a way that we wanna be able to tangibly help some people who may be in need right now. And we are clear on how we're going to do this we have, uh, we have this organized already and to do so in a way that doesn't violate uh, anything that um, our, our leaders are asking of us uh, here in our county or in our state. But I'm imagining some of you have some things maybe around your house or when you go grocery shopping that you could utilize to be able to share. Predominantly, our team was able to, kind of working through a number of different channels, find out some needs that would be present maybe among um, some of our church family or maybe among some people in our community or certainly among some of our partners in ministry. And they nailed that down to just a handful of things. Baby products, uh, hygiene products. What was the other one, Leroy? Paper products. So paper products, hygiene products, and baby products. Some of you have some of that in addition. Like you've got some stores of that in your house. Um, some, of, some of you got in line and you took advantage of that. Um, now, here's what I wanna ask of you. We are going to have available donation points in both Erie and Niagara County, okay? At our campus locations. We're gonna have donation points, which means this. If you're gonna be out going to the grocery store, or if some of you who are still working, I realize maybe in a very uh, different manner, um, and certainly we're not asking you to drive after certain hours if, they, if they're asking us for non-essential travel during those times. We're not asking for that. But we have times and designated places where you can just be in your car. You can have those things available, get out of your car, put them into a receptacle without having to touch anybody or do anything, get it back into your car and drive away. We've got on our end the ability to take all of that stuff and have it completely sanitized with some technology that we have been uh, connected to. We can have all of that sanitized and then we can get that out through our channels to be able to distrib uh, distribute that to people who are in need. So I wanna ask you to participate. You can do that if, regardless of where you may be watching me right now, if you go to thechapel.com slash armor project, that's a way for you to be able to see where all of the locations are, the drop-off points, and where the, um, what times those are going to be. Those are going to be at our campuses anyway, right, Leroy? All campuses, uh, Tuesday and Wednesday from nine to three. Yeah, so all of our campuses, Tuesday and Wednesday from nine to three, but you'll see all of that information on thechapel.com slash 
armor project. So make sure that you check that out. In addition, another way that you can be engaged is that we need a whole bunch of prayer warriors. We need an army of people that are praying, not only for requests that are pouring into us like we're getting right now, even on our social media channels, but also we want to be able to make sure that partners that are sharing with us, some of our Kingdom Come partners that are sharing needs that they have globally and nationally and locally, we wanna be able to intercede for them. We need an army of prayer partners, okay? Volunteers, because if you can't go anywhere, you can't do anything. And by the way, those of you who are a little older, this is a perfect opportunity for you to be an intercessor, to be a prayer partner. And by the way, there's tons of us that could be able to do this as well. And we need to know who you are so that we can get information to you to be praying. So we want you to be able to go to uh, thechapel.com as well. And on the chapel.com's landing page, you'll see an opportunity for you to be able to get signed up as a prayer partner, as a volunteer, so that we have your information and that we can connect with you along that line. Because this Wednesday, Lord willing, I'm gonna be doing a Facebook Live and we're gonna be praying, but we want to have an army of people that are praying alongside, all right? So that's another way that you can be engaged in the Armor Project. But let me mention to you one other one. I realize that for many, life right now is a little bit iffy. I get it. But there's others of us, others of you, who have a, a stable income based upon what you're doing. Maybe, you're, maybe your particular business or your particular job has not been interrupted during this time. Could I tell you that we still need to be a people who live generously and who give? Because not only do we want to facilitate being able to, to, to do some of the things that we're talking about doing as a church, but we actually wanna be able to share with other people and other parties and partners that maybe we can help meet needs of as well. So could I, could I encourage you to go to thechapel.com slash give, and maybe you're not signed up online to be able to give. This is the easiest way to be able to do it. And maybe you would be generous along that line. I'm certainly going to be, we're certainly going to be. But I would encourage us all, as we have ability, as God enables us, to still be a people of generosity. And thechapel.com slash give, you can do that. And also, if you want to mail it, when you go there to thechapel.com slash give, if you say, well, I'm more snail mail, that still works as well. And uh, the address and mailing address and everything is right there for you uh, as well. But I, I wanna say a final word, though, to those of you who maybe are watching that maybe have never before received Jesus and come to a place of putting your faith in him. I don't want to at all sound uh, crass when I say this, nor do I even think this is tone deaf. I simply think it's true that there is a virus worse than the coronavirus that has infected every human heart, and it's called sin. The Bible says it this way, we have all sinned and come short of the glory of God, and that the wages of our sin is death. That doesn't just mean physical death, it means a spiritual separation from God, that God who is holy and we who are sinful cannot be reconciled unless God has done that, and he has. This is the great news of the gospel, that God saw that even while we were yet sinful, that he still loved us, and he sent his son who came willingly. This isn't, a, this isn't an angry God who's, who's putting something upon this loving son, not at all. This is actually Jesus willingly going to a cross to, to die in our place, the perfect sacrifice, the sinless substitute to satisfy the justice of a God who is just, who is righteous, who is holy, and who will judge sin. And he judged our sin that was placed upon Jesus. And Jesus died for us and rose from the grave so that now by faith in him and because of what God has done for us in Jesus Christ, we can now be reconciled to God, forgiven of our sin and made new and have the hope not only in this life, but in the life to come. So if you've never come to a place of receiving Jesus, you can do that by faith, by putting your trust in him with all of your heart. And we would love and we stand ready to be able to help you in that. If you go simply to the chapel.com slash knowing Jesus, there's some information there as to how you can know Jesus, how you can receive Jesus. We would love to help you there.
but I want to also give you another option if you want to talk to a human being. You can simply call our church. That, that number is 716-631-2636 or 631-AMEN, if that helps you remember it. You can simply call that number and we actually have real human beings who would love to be able to speak to you and talk to you about what it means to receive Jesus Christ. Maybe you need to be able to speak to somebody about prayer as well. You take advantage of this. So the chapel.com slash knowing Jesus or by calling 7-1-6, of course, the area code, 631-2636. We would love to talk to you about what it means to know Christ. Father, I pray that you would work deeply in the hearts of every single person that has been under the sound of our voices, that you would minister life to them and grace to them, and that you would draw people to yourself, that we might all be more conformed into the image of Christ for the glory of God, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.